spiritual power, okay? Um, he, obviously, if you have been connected with the ministry very long, he had a lot of results, right? Thousands of people healed instantly, plus more that maybe took a little bit of time. So we're going to kind of study his, um, what he called his seven keys to spiritual power, okay? Um, now, this is found, if you have a DHT manual, this is found in your manual on page 192 and 193, as well as we now have bookmarks that have the seven keys to spiritual power on them. I thought it was really cool because these were in the process way before Jessica even asked me to teach on this, and they came in this week. So I thought it was really cool how God put those together. So you can pick those up out in the lobby out there. Um, again, John G. Lake's Seven Secrets to Spiritual Power. There's a lot to cover here in one session, but I'm going to do my best, so I'll have to try to move quickly through this, okay? Um, number one is spiritual hunger. Spiritual hunger. Now, it's important that we have um, everybody understanding the same definition, because if you have a wrong perception of a word, it can create a wrong belief. Okay, so I'm going to start with defining the word hunger. Okay, if you look it up either in um, Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary or uh, you Google it, you're pretty much going to get the same response. It's going to be basically what it means is a strong desire or craving. Okay, sometimes you even hear this called zeal. Okay, a spiritual zeal. And if you look that up, you're also going to get the same definition. It's going to say passionate desire, okay? So when, when we say spiritual hunger, what we mean is a spiritual desire, a, hung, a, a desire, a passionate desire for more of things spiritual, okay? Um, my husband, Wade, if you guys know him, he is a pilot, and he has made it known to me many times that he wants an airplane. So he has expressed a desire to have an airplane, right? Well, as a, a loving wife, I'm not going to go and give him a bag of screws. That's not going to fulfill that desire, right? If I give him a couple of pieces of metal, that's still not fulfilling his desire, right? When he expresses that desire, he doesn't want pieces. And he's not asking me for that because he has pieces. He wants the whole of all of those pieces working together and functioning the way that it should, right? So when we say we want a spiritual hunger or a desire for God, it is not that we have a desire for more of God, right? Because as we'll go through scripture here, when we become born again, when we have the new creation, we have all of God. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't say, here, I'll give you this piece, and then later I'll give you this piece. He gave us all of him. So what it is, is we have to learn how to use what he's given us, okay? Um, Matthew 5, verse 6. If you guys want to turn there with me. I know it'll be up on the screen here in a minute, but let me get to it. Matthew 5, verse 6. He said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I've heard this verse used a lot um, in reference to spiritual hunger, and it, it gives the implication that we hunger and then we get filled with God, and then we'll, have, we'll get hungry again and we need more of God, you know, and, and that's completely wrong. If you go back up to verse 4, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, the condition is mourning. But the fulfillment of that condition is being comforted, okay? So this is the same thing. If we are hungering for righteousness, that's you wanting to, to know God. That's, that's you, the Holy Spirit, drawing you to God. But once you come to God, you are filled. You now have everything that you need, everything that you hungered for. You now have that, right? Um, Jesus also told the lady at the well, that if you drink the water that I have, you will never thirst again, right? So Jesus even said, if we receive him, we will never thirst again. Ephesians 1, 3, let's go there. It 
Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, has, notice that's past tense, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So again, he has already blessed us. If you have received Jesus, then you already have all the blessing that you need in your life, all the healing, all the protection. You have everything that you need in your life, okay? Um, and one other scripture on this, Romans 8, 32. I love this. Well, <laughs> I say I love these scriptures, but I love them all. It's just some of them, you know, minister to you a certain times more than others. So Romans 8, 32 He says, he that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So again, when we receive the gift of Jesus in our hearts, when we have the new creation and are recreated in his image, we have all things. So as Christians, we don't hunger for more of God, right? I hope I've killed that sacred cow. We know as Christians, we have all of God that we need. He's given us everything. He's not withheld anything. But we should desire the fulfillment of what we have. That should be a desire that we have as Christians. Our spirit has his nature, Right, And when we have his nature, we have his wants. And so for a person to even tell me that they want to see God being manifested in a greater way, they have God's spirit in them because that's his desire. Right, When there's, when there's somebody walking with a cane or somebody who's in a wheelchair, it's his desire that they not be that way. And take that a step further. If they're lost, it's his desire that they should be, be saved. It says that he wishes that none should perish, right? So if that's our desire, then that is his desire as well because we have his nature. Um, and, and so the whole point of this is that we want to walk in the fullness. I'm just trying to really drive home the point that we have all of God. When we repent and make Jesus Lord, he gives us all of himself. He holds nothing back. Um, E.W. Kenyon, in his book, The Hidden Man, he makes this quote, and I love it. He says, when God imparts his nature to us, there comes with it all the attributes of himself. They are undeveloped, but they are there, lying latent in our human spirit. Uh, Brother Curry uses the analogy of a newborn baby. You know, a newborn baby, you count all the fingers and all the toes, and they've got two arms and two legs and two eyes, and so we count them and, and make sure that they are complete, right? They are complete. But then the process is learning how to use what we have, and this is no different. So the first step, again, we're talking about spiritual power. The first step in seeing God's will done in every situation. I'm going to kind of, instead of saying spiritual hunger, I'm going to kind of redefine that. It's developing a strong desire for the manifestation of God's heart in every situation. Okay. Um, there are studies that have proven that children, especially young children, if you blindfold them and you put them in a room with lots of women, they can usually pick out their mom. They can pick them out by a smell or the way she walks or a touch. Well, think about that. Why is that? Why would kids, they have this innate desire or innate sense to be able to tell? No, usually young kids spend most of their time with mom. Now, I'm not discrediting guys. I know you guys, you parents, uh, dads take a lot of time and help us with that as well. But typically, you guys are the providers, and so you're out of the house typically providing for your family, and mom is usually the one that's changing the diapers and feeding them and clothing them and all of this, right? So um, mom spends a lot of time teaching them how to talk, how to walk, how to feed themselves, 
Well, what is she doing when she's doing that? She is pushing them to do things that they don't realize they can do, right? She's helping them learn how to use what they have, getting them out of their comfort zone sometimes. I remember my daughter when we were teaching her to walk, um, you know how they grab onto your finger and they'll walk with your fingers, you know? Well, anytime we would pull our fingers out, she'd sit down because she thought she couldn't walk then. So we had these little rings and we'd have her grab onto the rings and start walking with her. Well, then we let go. And she kept walking because she didn't know we let go, right? So you have to teach children to do things that they may not know that they can do, right? Helping them, basically you're helping them realize who they are and what they have. Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 3. I was thinking about this and Holy Spirit just dropped this in my heart and it was just such a, a blessing. Matthew 18, verse 3. It says, verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So first you have to be converted. Then you have to learn what you have and who you are, right? That's how we walk in the kingdom, the fullness of the kingdom, right? Um, Let's go to um, John 16. Verse 13. This says, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he says, uh, verse 12 says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own accord, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. So basically, the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us learn what we have and how to use it, right? Just like parents showing their kids how to use what they have, the Spirit shows us who we are and how to use what we have. Again, Romans 8, 22, as we read earlier, with Jesus, he has given us all things. So the first step in seeing God's will done in every situation is what? How do we do that? We develop a strong desire. And how do we develop that desire? Well, the first step, honestly, is to get born again. Because when you become born again, then you have his nature in you right? If you don't have his nature, you're not going to have a desire typically to see his will done on this earth. So the first step is to get born again, okay? Then if you're a Christian and you've noticed that that has waned a little bit, then it's time for an evaluation, okay? If you're not really desiring to see God's will done in the situations, it's time to take an evaluation of where we're at. Uh, Brother Curry in his book, Behold the Kingdom, says, to align yourself with God's purposes, you must first die to self. So there's our key. How do we walk more in the fullness of what we're given? Walking according to the spirit, not the flesh. Okay, so in Galatians 5.17, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you real quick. Galatians 5.17 says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. So if you are not having a desire or not seeing the desire that you have of God's will being done in this situation, in any situation, you have to choose to walk more by the spirit, crucify the flesh, as we would say, right? How do you do that? You do the Bible. Doing the Bible is what will help crucify the flesh. Okay? And you walk according to the scriptures, you're walking according to the spirit. Just as a child spends time with a mother, we need to spend time with the father. And we need to allow the spirit to develop the things that are in us. So the first 
Um, key again, first key again to spiritual power is to develop that desire to see God's will manifested in every situation. We do that by crucifying the flesh and walking according to the spirit. Now, I'm going to venture to say, and I know this is a little different than we normally hear, but I'm going to venture to say, how do we do that? How do we really crucify the flesh and walk according to the spirit? Well, I'm going to say the next six keys is how we do that. Okay, so let's go to number two. Second key, seeing God's will done in every situation is feeding on the word of God. Feed on the word of God as constantly as possible. Now, this is not listening to Christian TV. I hear a lot of people say they have Christian TV playing all day. That's not feeding on the word of God. That's getting several men's opinion on the word of God, okay? That is not going to help you grow in spiritual things, okay? You have to spend time in the word. This doesn't mean listening to podcasts all day, okay? Because again, those are men's opinion. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now notice here that he says, you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Why? Why? because you're walking according to the word, because you're meditating on it, you're thinking about it, your life is being directed by the word, right? So there are three parts to feeding on the word, three keys. First is reading. Obviously, you want to read the word, okay? And it's very important to read a section. If you're going to read through the Bible, that's great, but, but there's more than just reading through it, okay? You want to pick a section, and especially if there's one particular verse you want to study, you want to read like six scriptures above and six scriptures below. That helps you keep it in context. That's so, so important because a lot of times you will hear even ministers pull a scripture out that fits with the point they're trying to make, which is completely not the context that scripture is really meaning. Okay, so it's important. Read six scriptures before and six scriptures after. Okay, so read. You want to do that, get the overall picture. Then, as we talked about earlier, as far as learning to read, you study it. You want to break it apart. This is where you get your Strong's Concordance out. You get your Dake's Bible out. You uh, go to the Weast. Go to your Thayer's ne Lexicon. Get your study tools out, right? If, if Wade is going to learn about a, a new airplane or a new um, avionics that's come out in an airplane, he's going to get all the manuals out, and he's going to really study about that part. So that's what we have to do with the Word of God is really study it. Then you have to meditate on it, really thinking about it, really um, going over in your mind and repeating it to yourself throughout the day. This, if you've gone through the mind renewal, you know that this is the key. Um, consistency, frequency, and repetition. This is how we renew our mind to the word of God, right? And, um, and declarations, as we do here in the mornings um, before service. It's great, and I encourage you to get the little book. I forgot to bring mine up with me. Um, the Acknowledging What's in You. Do those declarations and declare them over yourself and over your, your family and your situation, whether it be your finances, whatever it is, because that's getting the word into you, okay? Um, the, the word meditate really, and, and most of you already know, but the word meditate really is thinking about something over and over again. And I like to say savor. You know, I love cookies. I love cookies. <laughs> it is my vice. But when I am eating a cookie, I'm going to eat it slowly. And I'm going to savor every bite, right? Because I don't get them that often. So I love to savor the cookies. So this is how we should treat the word of God. 
if we're really wanting to get it in us, we spend time and we really savor the Word of God. Take what, if you're doing a, a word study in the morning, take it throughout the day and just focus on it. Take a few minutes at lunch, take a few minutes in the afternoon, a few minutes at dinner time, and really think about what it is you're studying. Meditate on the Word. So feeding on God's Word is three different things, okay? Reading, studying, and meditating. This is one key of how to walk in spiritual power, and it also will facilitate you killing the flesh, dying to the flesh, and living more according to the Spirit, okay? And again, I think um, of this, I, I chuckle when I think of moms who find out that they're pregnant with their first child. A lot of times they will read everything they can find about what it's like to be pregnant and have a child, even sometimes to the point of where they're frustrating dad because <laughs> I'm tired of hearing about this, right? But when you really want to learn something and grow in it, you're really going to study and, and, and spend a lot of time thinking about it, okay? So the third key then to seeing God's will done in every situation is communion with God. Communion with God. This is um, something that goes, well, it's a necessity with a relationship. Really, the whole point of Jesus coming was because the Father wanted our relationship with him. He wanted that relationship restored. He lost that at the fall. He couldn't commune with man, and he wants that with us. So this is where we spend time with God and we really allow that communication to develop. Now, again, there are three parts here, but and one of them most people have. We pray, right? When we pray, we go to God and we tell him everything. We hear that all the time. You can tell God anything. And that's very, very true. You can tell God anything. And he wants you to talk with him. He wants you to share your heart and to be honest with him. The one thing he doesn't want, though, and it's just like with a natural relationship, don't go to him complaining all the time. You know, if you have somebody in your life who is always coming to you complaining about a situation, you usually are going to try to avoid them, right? It's not your favorite person. But when you, you can go to him and talk to him about situations, that's great. But go with solutions, Know that your scripture and say, Father, you say in your word this about the situation. So talk to him about the promises that he's made, okay? And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because most people have that down. They know they can talk to God. Um, but the next uh, way that we commune with God is listening. God wants to talk to us as well in any relationship. It's just like um, men when you were courting your wives, there was a lot of communication back and forth. You would listen and you would talk. I remember Wade and I would sit out um, at a coffee shop till like three in the morning, just talking back and forth and listening. Now this is something that you have to develop. Listening is a skill that you have to develop. And so if you're wanting to learn how to do this with God, I encourage you to learn how to do it in your natural relationships. I'm sure we can all be a better listener in every situation, right, with our kids with our, our parents, with our spouse. So practice listening. And by listening, I don't mean thinking about how you're gonna respond to what they're saying. That's not listening. Really value the person and what they're saying because our breath is a vital um, resource that we have. And so they're using their breath to communicate with you. Value that, listen to what they're saying and then respond, okay? So it's just like with any other relationship, God has a lot to say to you. So take time, after you have spoken to him, take time and just be quiet and let him talk to you, okay? Um, the next part of communion with God is practicing his presence. I was thinking about this, and again, trying to think of an analogy. I, I, I was taken back to high school and I'm just gonna speak for girls because I'm a girl, but usually when you have a young man that you like, you will draw his name on your books or you'll think about the date that you're gonna go on. You think about being with this person, right? Men, I'm not a man, so I don't know if you do that, but I'm assuming you do. So the same thing is with God. 
take time and just say, Father, I know that you're with me right here, right now. And the fullness of what you have is in me. So just take time and recognize that, that no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, he's right there. And when you go to minister to somebody, the same thing is true. Before you step out to go pray for somebody, Father, I thank you that you are in me, that you are with me, and that you're the one that's going to minister to this person. And just practice his presence, okay? Um, a lot of times, um, <laughs> uh, I put it here in my notes, thinking about um, my first apartment when I um, had moved into my first apartment, I remember walking around going, I'm really an adult. I'm really, I'm really on my own, you know? And I was practicing <laughs> being an adult and realizing, wow, I'm really here. This thing that I wanted all my life, I'm really doing. We have the Spirit of God in us. How can we not just take a few minutes and say, God, you're with me. You're right here with me. That's part of that communion. You know, I, I, um, sometimes it's great, wives, to do this with your spouse, too. Just say, you know what? I'm so thankful that you are part of my life. I thank you. I'm thankful that we get to do life together, you know? So, so it's in every area, but especially because we're talking about walking in more spiritual power, take the time to practice the presence of God, okay? So communion, again, with God, communion with God is talk, is um, talking prayer, listening prayer, and then practicing the presence of God, okay? And that's communion. So again, it's just developing that relationship. If you're not sure exactly how to do that, go back to when you're in a physical relationship. You want to talk to that person. You want that person to talk with you. And you just want to practice their presence. Okay? The fourth key to seeing God's will done in every situation, because again, that's what we broke this down to. We want to see God's will done in every situation that we're involved in is fellowship with like-minded believers. Now, this is one reason why we're in church today, right? Because you wanted to come and be with people who thought the same way that you thought, who were moving forward and, and wanting to see more of God manifested in their life, right? Um, we were at, a, at dinner with some friends the other day, and the waiter, um, one of the people we were with, had a, a real southern accent, and the waiter came over and was asking where they were from and this kind of thing. And he mentioned that he was from the Deep South and he hated his accent so much so that he went to school, had a trainer teach him how to talk without his accent. That's how much he didn't want it. But he said, if I stand here and talk to you very long, I'm gonna pick that accent up. <laughs> So it's that easy to pick up an accent. And if you go to another country, you can, you can realize that as well, that you'll pick up the accent there if you're very long. Why is that? Because we're around them and we're becoming who we're around, right? Um, learning a new language. They tell you the best way to learn a new language is total immersion. Well, what does that mean? You're completely surrounded with other people who are speaking that language. It's no different with the things of God. If you are around people who are always talking about Facebook, talking about the news, if you're constantly listening to the news, if you're around people who are constantly negative, how are you going to be? Constantly negative, constantly thinking about the bad things that are in the news, right? So you have to, if you're wanting to see more of a manifestation, manifestation of the things of God, you have to fellowship with like-minded believers, okay? Okay. This is um, a part of um, life teams. This is what life teams are all about, getting together with like-minded people and, and growing up into Christ together, right? Um, at the last annual conference, um, Chris and Margie from the UK brought um, a gentleman that works with them there named Christian. I don't know if you guys remember Christian. You can't forget Christian very easily, um, I am typically a very introverted person. I would much rather be on my couch with a book and alone. That's how I prefer to spend my time. Um, but being around Christian, what, what little I was, 
I mean, he is such a, he goes into mosques and preaches the gospel. He, if you guys were there at annual conference, he took groups into bars and were ministering to people there. I mean, he got, we went to dinner with him one time and he got on a microphone in the restaurant and was preaching the gospel over the microphone. I mean, he is just um, not afraid of anything really and really walking in the boldness of God. And, and he made me, just being around him that little time, I found myself at a, an outdoor area and I wanted to do open air preaching. And I'm like, what is this? This is not who I normally am. I did not do it. I did not step out like I should have. But the desire was there, right? And so the desire was created by being around somebody who did that. So that's why it's so important that we are around like-minded people. Okay, because you do become who you are. That's the life teams. You're discipling each other, right? Uh, Proverbs 4, um, verse 23. Let's turn there real quick. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Wow, can't get much more clear than that. And then Proverbs 13, 20. Again, remember, we always want to find scripture for the things that we're believing for, right? And this is just another scripture that makes this very, very clear. Not just making this up. Not just telling you to find friends that you want to be around. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he that walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. Take stock of who you're around and who you spend your time. Now, I know you can't pick your, well, you can pick your job. <laughs> So think about who you're spending your time with because those people will affect who you are and who you act like, okay? So again, the fourth key to seeing God's will done in every situation is fellowship with like-minded believers. The next one, number five, is public confession of who you are in Christ and who he is in you. We talked about this a little bit uh, earlier about declarations. This is very, very important because again, our whole desire, whole reason for, for wanting uh, more manifestations is to realize that we need to know what we have and know how to walk in it. And the spirit will, will teach us that. But declarations are how you declare that over yourself. And, and as we've gone through mind renewal, if you haven't, I encourage you to do that. Um, but we've talked about it earlier. Renewing your mind to the word of God. Declarations is a great way to do this because you are declaring. If you're in here with us at 8.15 or 8 o'clock, whenever it starts for the declarations, you get a good taste of what that's like. Declaring who you are. And basically, these are statements that they're scriptures that we have taken and made first person. You can do that with almost any scripture. Take it and make it first person and declare it over yourself. Now, don't, when I say declare it over yourself, it's not simply repeating what it says, okay? It's very, very important that you're not just reading the words and saying them over yourself. What is that? That's vain repetition. And that's not gonna bring any fruit that you want. Okay, it's very, very important that when you're making these declarations that you're paying attention to what you're saying. Okay, you're declaring this over yourself because this is who you are, right? You are not this body. You are the spirit that's inside of you and you have to walk in that. And if that's your desire, you're gonna declare it because the more that you say it, the more your mind is gonna hear it and it's going to renew your mind right? And that's how we walk in more manifestations, is that we understand who we are and how to walk in it. So declarations, what do we declare? Well, you can start with as simply as saying, Jesus is Lord. 
Jesus is Lord over me. He's over my life. He's Lord over my finances. He's Lord over my family. He's Lord over my job. Declare that over yourself. Um, Mark 28 and I'm sorry, Mark 16 and Matthew 28, the Great Commission, declaring these things over yourself. I preach the gospel to every creature. Well, what is that doing? You're, you're declaring, this is who I am, and this is how I'm going to act. I will declare the gospel to every creature. Okay? Um, the golden rule, Matthew 7, 12. I do unto others what I want them done, what I want done to me. Right? Declaring that over yourself. Uh, the abiding anointing. This is something that, depending on your background, you need to also declare over yourself and maybe break down some sacred cows, some strongholds that have been there. The abiding anointing, 1 John 2.27. 1 John 2.27. I have an anointing that abides in me. It doesn't wane. It doesn't go. It abides. It is with me all the time. And it teaches me all things right? Because the spirit we read earlier in John 16, the spirit leads us into all truth. So that anointing is always with you, always teaching you. Power over the enemy, Luke 10, 19, right? I have authority over all the ability of the enemy and nothing, nothing shall by any means harm me. Nothing shall by any means harm me. Declare that over yourself, okay? Um, the next one, John 14, 12. John 14, 12. You don't have to look it up. Why don't you declare it with me? Okay? Declare it. Now, don't just repeat what I'm saying, but declare it. I believe on Jesus. I believe on Jesus. Therefore, Therefore I, will I will do the same works, the same works as, Jesus as Jesus and greater. And greater. Hallelujah. Now, now you have to go do it or you're lying, <laughs> All right? Okay, so build, um, declaring like this and speaking over your life like this builds the word of God in you and enforces it in your life. Again, we go back to what are we studying? We're studying about how to have more manifestations in every situation, right? This is how you do it. I'm giving you the steps of how to do that, Okay. Again, Jesus defeated the enemy when he was being tempted. How did he defeat the enemy? It is written. The same thing that we just did, declaring the word. Um, and as we've mentioned, this is how you renew your mind. It's also how you crucify or mortify the deeds of the flesh because you are now focused on what the word of God says about you. And that's how you choose to to um, live your life and to have your actions come in line with that, right? So the sixth key, I've got to get through this real quick. Um, the sixth key to seeing God's will done in every situation is praying in tongues. Dr. Lake said that praying in tongues was the making of his ministry. Without it, he wouldn't have seen the things that he saw. So it's very important to pray in tongues. Um, there are three ways to do this. Loud long and intensely. Um, if you're just praying under your breath, that's, a, that's considered a maintenance tongue. It's just going to keep you where you're at. It's just going to keep you at the same level that you're at. If you get loud, it brings up the fight in you, right? And it builds you up and helps you stand firm in a crisis. Long, this is something, again, Going back to why we're studying this, we want to see more manifestations. So if you're praying in the spirit about five minutes a day, you need to take that a little bit longer. Go 10 minutes and then stretch it. Go 15 minutes. Then go on a walk and do 30 minutes out and 30 minutes back. But stretch yourself, push yourself to do this more. And the more that you pray in the spirit, the more that you will see that the flesh is being crucified and you're living more according to the spirit. And I'll tell you something else. If you do this, you're going to hear him talk to you more because you're taking time to really commune with him. 
So stretch the amount of time that you're praying in the spirit, okay? Intensely. Fight like your life depends on it because the angels hearken to the voice of the word of God. And when you're praying in the spirit, that's the spirit praying in ways you don't know how to pray. So pray intensely, okay? Um, and always yield to promptings. Um, one situation I had, um, I was waking in the middle of the night, probably about two o'clock in the morning uh, one night. And so I just got up and I felt a real desire um, to pray in the spirit for my daughter, which moms, you probably frequently <laughs> get those um, leadings to do that. Um, but I, I really felt um, to pray for her. So I prayed for her pretty intently in the spirit for about 20 minutes. And then I just felt like, okay, Whatever it was is done. Um, And then I talked with her about a week later and found out she was a a newer driver and she had somebody else in the car with her at that point that was a more experienced driver. And they were taking a road trip late at night. I think it was around two o'clock in the morning. And at some point, for no reason, really, she couldn't really explain it, but she stopped, she pulled over and had this other person drive. Well, just a few miles down the road was this huge deer in the middle of the road that she would not have known how to handle being a fairly new driver. Well, I'm not taking credit for that. That was Holy Spirit getting me up. That was protecting her. So always give in to those yieldings that you feel. Don't ever be too busy to do that. Now, we know that praying in tongues you can do and your mind can be doing something else, right? So never push those yieldings aside. Always pay attention to that because you don't know what you're praying about. And it's something obviously that needs to be covered, right? The seventh um, key to walking in spiritual power, this is the one everybody loves, is action, right? You got to act on the word of God. Let me put it to you this way. You do what you believe. If you're not doing it, you don't believe it, okay? James 1.22 says, but be ye doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Because if you're a hearer only, you're deceiving yourself. You must be a doer of the word. If you're not doing what you're learning, your learning ceases to be a blessing and will become a curse. Because your spirit man knows that you're supposed to be acting on what you know. And if you're not doing it, you will feel the conviction of it. I'm going to take this and kind of go the opposite way on it. If we have a young child who touches a stove, we're going to say, oh, no, don't do that. It's hot. And they'll feel the experience of it, right? But if an adult goes over and puts their hand on the stove, we're going to think, You should know better, right? They should know better, but they're not acting on what they know. So as you're growing in the things of God, are you acting on what you know? Because if not, just like we would look at an adult putting their hand on a hot stove, that's not right. Because your spirit is in you so that you can be a blessing to others, okay? Um. Dr. Lake said, it is a law of the human mind that I can act myself into believing faster than I can believe myself into acting. I was thinking about this and meditating on this, and the the analogy that came up to me was riding a bike. If I have a bike sitting there and I say, I believe I can ride it, I believe I can ride it, I believe I can ride that bike, I believe I can ride that bike, is that helping me ride the bike? No, but if I get on the bike, then I act like I know what I'm doing. I may fall, but I'm getting back on because I believe I can ride the bike, right? So act yourself into believing, okay? So real quickly, a review. To see God's will done in every situation, spiritual hunger, which is an intense desire, be born again, and then kill the, the deeds of the flesh, mortify the deeds of the flesh. Romans 8 is a good, ver- a good chapter to read on mortifying the deeds of the flesh. Number two, feed on the word of God. Number three, communion with God. 
Number four, fellowship with like-minded Christians. Five, public confession of who you are and who Christ is in you. Number six, praying in tongues. Number seven, action. Okay? So we'll go ahead and close. Um, I want to make um, available to you, uh, first of all, as we mentioned first off, if you are not born again, you're not going to have this desire. But if you want to give your life to Christ, then feel free to come down. Um, If you'll come over on this side, um, we'll have prayer people or people minister. (music) 